ENM is a tough concept to understand. There's so many different components and sometimes it can make more sense when you isolate one specific code and just go over the components that way. When I was a coding supervisor, I supervised the coding specialist who did a lot of audits and education on our providers. And one of the concepts that we focused on was our level fives because those were our biggest risks. So we used to look at a lot of documentation all together and say, hey, the provider thinks this is a level five. Um, what does everyone else think? Or we would say, hey, the provider coded it this way, but I think this is a level five. Does everyone else agree? Because sometimes there's just these little tiny details that you can see it maybe hits a level five or it doesn't hit a level five. If you're not super familiar with the different levels of office outpatient visits, so for office outpatient, we have five different levels, one, two, three, four, and five. The higher the level, the bigger payment that's attached to it in our fee-for-service world. So most providers want to bill a level five when it's warranted because they know they're going to get reimbursed more money. But what are the components of a level five visit? Well, let's take a look. So this is the grid for billing office and outpatient visits, code 99201 through 99215, starting January 1st of 2021. Now you can watch some of my older videos if you want on how to bill them based off of history exam medical decision making for dates of service prior to that. But effective January 1, 2021, this is what we utilize. And what the guidelines basically tell us is for a level five service, so we're gonna isolate, we're gonna talk just about this section down here, our level 99205 or 99215. We need a medically appropriate history and examination. So what does that mean medically appropriate? So for example, if a patient's coming in and they have knee pain, I would expect to see that the provider examined their knee. So I would want to see a musculoskeletal examination and a review of their knee. Like, are you having knee pain? I would think that would be medically appropriate for something that was coming in for a patient complaint for knee pain. Prior to that, there were all these little boxes and we had to calculate all the different boxes. And even if they weren't related, uh, oftentimes providers could score higher levels of service. But now they're saying, you know, because we've automated this and made it so much more efficient with EMRs to just do a complete review of systems or do a complete exam, it's just saying, hey, providers, do what's medically appropriate. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't have to document a history and exam. They should. It just should be pertinent to what their thought process is, what they're performing, what they're asking, what they're examining with that patient that day. So if we zoom in actually here on our level five service, let's actually look at these columns first. So here we have the code, the level of medical decision making, and it says we need two out of the three elements of medical decision making. So these are our three elements. First one is number and complexity of problems addressed. Next is our amount of data or complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed, and then our risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality of patient management. Again, I'm gonna link this below so you can follow along if you wanna look at your own copy, but we need to meet at least two out of the three in the row that we're trying to code for. So we would need to meet either the number and complexity of problems and amount of data, or number of complexity of problems and risk, or complexity of data and risk. So two out of these three here, one, two, three elements, we need to meet at least three of these. So if we look at our level five, that means we would need to hit either the level, to get our high level decision making, we would need to hit either the elements here and here or here and here or here and here. So two out of these three of these components, one, two, three. So in order to meet a high complexity, we have to get one of these two things, either this or this. One is one or more chronic illnesses with severe exacerbation, progression, or side effects of treatment, or one acute or chronic illness or injury that poses a threat to life or bodily function. So for example, a patient has COPD. If they have a severe exacerbation of their COPD, uh, that would qualify as high. So you know, just the status of saying COPD exacerbation alone doesn't qualify that because it says it has to be severe. And that's a very key term there. We have to prove that this is a severe exacerbation of a COPD or an asthma or of kidney failure, something that is a severe or side effects treatment. So severe side effects of their treatment. Or we could meet one acute or chronic illness or injury that poses a threat to life or bodily function. So remember bodily function is part of that. So if maybe the patient is going to lose function of their kidney or their liver 
or even their ambulation because maybe they have gangrene and they're at risk of losing a limb. Bodily function, that would qualify. They're posing a threat to life. They are either going to die or they are going to lose a bodily function. Something like losing their sight, losing their limb, losing their uh, liver. And if you're ever concerned about these definitions and if something you're looking at meets the definition or not, reference this guide and I'll link this below. You can easily access it for free online. The AMA does provide this for free. It's the CPT ENM Officer Other Outpatient and Prolonged Service Code and Guideline Changes. So these are the ones that were effective January 1st, 2021. They also made technical corrections on this on March 9th of 2021 and they retro affected them to January 1st of 2021. And here you can see it gives some examples of this and it says examples may include acute myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolus, severe respiratory distress, not just respiratory distress, severe respiratory stress, progressive severe rheumatoid arthritis, etc, etc, etc. Now back to our grid. So if we're looking at this element and we want to see if we meet this element, this is what we would need to meet this extensive level of data reviewed. So we have to meet at least two out of these three categories, meaning that this is category one, this is category two, this is category three. We have to get at least two of those. So we could meet this or this or this or this or this or this. So, so two of these three. So category one, we would need any combination of three of the following, a review of prior external notes from each unique source, a review of the results of each unique test, ordering of each unique test, assessment requiring an independent historian. And you can find those definitions again on that guideline page here. It even tells you what we consider analyzed, what we consider a test. Um, it says here, this is one of the technical corrections that they put in here because there was some confusion about this. A pulse oximetry is not a test. Uh, I've had these in a lot of primary care, urgent care settings, even the, it's that little clip that they put on your finger. And the reason they don't consider it a test is because it's more of a vital sign versus having a test. And each unique test is defined by that CPT code. So for it to be a test, it has to have a CPT code and you can't be billing out for it separately because if you're billing it out for it separately as that separate CPT code, you're getting paid for reviewing and analyzing it on that CPT code. You can't also get reimbursed for that in the consideration for your E&M level as well. Category two is independent interpretation of tests. So independent interpretation of a test performed by another physician or qualified healthcare professional, again, not separately reported. Now, if you do something like a point of care test where you're doing a, like you're in pregnancy, where you, you're just looking and, and analyzing the results, it's either positive or negative, you either get credit for ordering or you get credit for reviewing that test. You can't get credit for both. So then our category two would be independent interpretation of a test performed by another physician or another qualified healthcare professional that's again, not separately reported. So if you're not billing out for interpreting that test, you can count it for part of your E&M service. And then category three in here is discussion of management or test interpretation. So discussion of management or test interpretation with an external physician, so someone not in your physician group, or other qualified healthcare professional appropriate source not separately reported. Again, you can't be billing it out separately as an E&M. Um, an external physician, they do define. And there has been some questions about this because I've worked, for example, with a lot of pediatrician offices where they have peds and then they have peds specialties come in. So they might have a peds gastro and a peds cardiology uh, because those are different subspecialties, they would not be considered the same group. So if PEDS is consulting with PEDS cardio, that would be an external source. Because if you look here at the definition, it says an external physician or other qualified healthcare professional who is not in the same group practice or is in a different specialty or subspecialty. So for high risk, they do give some examples only, but so it has to be something that is along this level of severity of risk. If you're looking for more examples, I would actually recommend the Evaluation and Management Compendium. I will link that below. I have the digital version, but they also make a print version and you can buy it on Amazon. And that gives a lot more clarification. It is published by the AMA. And I find it helpful because they don't give the clinical vignettes, they took those out in 2021 because people were using those to code off of. They would say, hey, this example here in the book is what in my E&M case is that I'm looking at for the documentation and that's the same level. 
Um, and now that we're kind of tweaking things, they kind of temporarily at least took those uh, small sample of like, this is the type of scenario it would look like. If you look at the back of your e &M book for 2021, you can still find them for other types of evaluation and management services, but not office outpatient. They took those out temporarily. But some examples would be drug therapy requiring intensive monitoring for toxicity again, and that is defined here in the guidelines that the AMA gave us. So it says a drug that requires intensive monitoring is a therapeutic agent that has the potential to cause serious morbidity or death. The monitoring is performed for assessment of these adverse effects and not primarily for the assessment of therapeutic efficacy. So not just checking to make sure that the uh, medication is working, but to make sure that they're not having any toxic or adverse side effects. And then it does give us some nice examples here. So it says examples may include monitoring for cytopenia and the use of an antineoplastic agent between dose cycles or the short-term intensive monitoring of electrolytes and renal function in a patient who is undergoing diuresis. Examples of monitoring that do not qualify include monitoring glucose levels, which I've heard some hospitalists try to say in the past, but yeah, monitoring glucose levels during insulin therapy does not, unless severe hypoglycemia is a current significant concern. It also doesn't qualify if it's annual electrolytes and renal function for a patient on a diuretic. It has to be intensive monitoring. Another example here is decision regarding elective major surgery with identified patient or procedural risk factors. So not just the normal, you know, these are the risks of just surgery in general, but specific to that patient. Also, the AMA does not go by the global surgical package definition of major surgery. Um, you can elect as a healthcare organization to say, well, we're just going to go with as far as major or minor surgeries, our definition is going to go with global periods and have that in writing. Um, it, it does kind of help more to streamline your processes within the healthcare organization that way. But technically speaking, per the AMA, they do not go just by the Medicare definition of what is a major surgery versus what is a minor surgery. And what I mean by that is Medicare has certain surgeries that they've said they has a 90 day global. Like we expect that the recovery period, everything that's going to be included in that should be about 90 days. So those are your big surgeries. So things like delivering a baby or having part of your liver removed or a kidney removed would be a major surgery. Something that would be more like a minor 10 day would be, you know, having a laceration repair or a mole removal, or maybe a foreign body removed. So that's gonna have a, a short duration of recovery. They're only gonna include your post-op care for 10 days for those minor services. An example of something that could be high risk as well, decision regarding emergency major surgery, a decision regarding hospitalization, which I find interesting because in regards to the hospitalization, they do kind of make this remark here. So for example, decision about hospitalization includes consideration of alternative levels of care, but ultimately it doesn't say they have to be hospitalized as an inpatient. It says that they are deciding that that's part of their medical decision-making. They're looking at this patient and going, gosh, you know, we might have to hospitalize them. And then finally in our level five, one of the examples is decision to not resuscitate or to de-escalate care because of poor prognosis. And that doesn't mean they're just looking at their end of life care decision or just stating that the patient's a DNR. It means for that date of service, for that level consideration, for that medical decision making, they had that conversation, made that discussion to not resuscitate or they're de-escalating care. They're moving them into hospice. One of the things I've run into in the past is I've worked with hospitals that had hospitalists and then they had palliative care services, which were separate. And the palliative care providers would have those decisions regarding either end of life care wishes, or, you know, hospice care, and they would bill out the appropriate codes for that. And then the hospitalist would come in the same day and go, oh, well, we're de-escalating care. They're going on hospice and they would want to get credit for that as well. Well, all that decision was really made by palliative care, not hospitalists. They were just notating the fact that those decisions were already made. So the hospitalist services would not get credit for those end of life care planning or wishes. That would all go to palliative care. So let's say we have a patient here and they've got a severe exacerbation of their condition and they have, and we have a decision regarding elective major surgery that would count for our level five because we've met two of these three elements that would be around that high risk. They're doing major surgery 
and they are having a severe exacerbation. Now, the difference between the 205 and the 15 is the new versus established, and that goes back to our definitions in our CPT book. So in your CPT book, they do provide a decision tree for new versus established patients, which is helpful. But basically, um, a new patient is one who has not received any professional services from the physician or qualified healthcare physician in the exact same specialty and subspecialty. So kind of going back to our peds versus peds cardiology. And they've uh, not had services within that past three years. So if they are established, they have seen a provider in that group in that same specialty, subspecialty within the past three years. So that's our difference between our new versus our established patients. Sometimes with large organizations, it can get difficult because they will group certain specialties together for the insurance companies. So you might get denial saying, hey, this isn't a new patient. It's really established. And from what I've experienced in the past, oftentimes you try to appeal and send notes and the insurance company just kind of stands by what they say that it's an established patient and they're going to pay you that lower established patient rate. Now we could also just bill the services based off of time. So it would be 60 to 75 minutes. The provider has to document an actual exact time, not say it was approximately 60 to 75 minutes or it was approximately 62 minutes. Um, because they want the exact time for Medicare. Now for our 99215 services, it can be 40 to 54 minutes of total time. And the total time definition is on here as well. So if you look here, when we're talking about total time, that includes basically everything except for rooming the patient and taking their vitals. So we have preparing to see the patient, reviewing their tests, obtaining or reviewing separately obtained history, performing a medically appropriate examination or evaluation, counseling and educating the patient, family, or caregiver, ordering medications, tests, or procedures, referring and communicating with other healthcare professionals when we're not separately reporting it out, billing it with another CPT code, documenting clinical information in the EMR, independently interpreting test results and communicating results to the patient or family caregiver and care coordination. Things that are not included are performance of services that are, are billed separately. So if we're doing a cerumen removal, that doesn't go into our time because that's a service we're billing out with a separate CPT code. Travel is not included. And teaching that is general and not limited to discussion that is required for the management of a specific patient is not included in that total time. So that's it for our level five services. If you want to see me go through all the other levels, just kind of go backwards from five, four, three, two, one. Definitely let me know in the comments below. I will see you guys in the next video. And until then, just keep on coding on.